If you read the LAPD's policy guidelines, you get a sense for what the department is supposed to be. And Russell Poole for 19 and a half years was with the LAPD. And he had come to believe that that's what he could expect from his department. And he considered it to be his department. His father was an L.A. County Sheriff, and so Russell grew up in a cop family. And his father had huge integrity and was very well known in the Sheriff's Department. And when you read the policy guidelines inside of LAPD, you get a sense of what the department is supposed to be. And for most of Russell's career, he found it to be just that. He found it to be a department where integrity was valued above everything else, where the truth meant something. And his investigations, in most cases, led to the killers, led to the truth, and led to convictions. But when he stumbled upon people inside the department that had committed crimes, the whole dynamic of Russell Poole's life changed. And now we have an innocent man in Russell Poole, a Boy Scout, who has stumbled upon corruption inside the department. And like the rest of his career, he was never told that he couldn't go certain places or investigate certain things. And so he wanted to get to the bottom of it and he wanted to make arrests, get convictions. And unfortunately, because he hit this wall inside of LAPD and he found corrupt officers were involved in criminal activity, he was told by his managers to stand down, to stop his investigation. He started to see case files being purged. He saw reports gutted. He saw a cover-up by management. And when he stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with management in a feud and in an internal fight within the department, he eventually was the loser. He was pushed out of the department. Now think about how tough things must be. I mean, six months is a really short time, right? Right now it's uh, August, you know, so we're, we're talking about being able to last from August until February. Things were so bad inside of the department that his pension would have vested in six months and it would have meant a huge increase in what his retirement would yield for him. And yet the pressures that were brought to bear upon him inside the department, the ridicule, the constant badgering inside of the department, the harassment that he had to go through, pushed him out six months before his retirement. There's one famous incident where there's a toilet and there's a pipe that flows underneath the toilet and inside the pipe is a turd and there is a, a message to Russell, you are here. And that gets left on his desk. And by the way, the same desk where he had the homicide investigator's oath sitting on his desk or not sitting but pinned on his desk so that he would constantly be reminded that it was his job to get to the truth no matter what. And so Russell Poole gets pushed out of the department and he takes his fight 
with LAPD public. He gets an attorney and he sues LAPD. Well, one thing that we've learned about Los Angeles and about courts here and about attorneys here is they have to appear before these same judges. They have to appear in these same courts. They have to see the same people. And so there's a polite thing that happens in court and Russell Poole's cases go nowhere. And so Russell suffers a huge financial blow by not being able to get his pension. And then Russell loses his cases and now he is consigned to really living a life where he could not be hired. Uh, I sat on the uh, Security Council in Century City for a number of years and it's just a bunch of security managers in Century City and I would book speakers for them and what have you and I sent Russell Poole's resume out to all of those security managers and a couple of them came back to me because I know him pretty well I've known him for years they said hey we've been told not to hire him so there was some kind of an unofficial blacklist on Russell Poole in the Los Angeles area he ends up going to work for the courts and he's a security guard working for the courts and that's the employment he's able to get a huge difference from the employment that he once had at LEPD as a storied uh, police detective working on over 500 cases 300 of which he was the lead detective on. And two of the cases that haunted him were the Tupac and Biggie murder cases. There were other pet cases that he had that he wanted to solve, but these two cases really haunted him because here's two murders that happen, and in each case you have hundreds and hundreds of witnesses, and yet no real investigation, no real prosecution no conviction no arrests and these are cases he felt should have been solved they were in the public interest to solve they had leads that did not get pursued but these cases are still unsolved and so we had written uh, a book together with a partner there was a huge falling out with that partner and the last year of Russell's life, uh, Russell and I decided that we were going to continue to try and actually get arrests and convictions. Because for us, that was the goal. It wasn't about a P.T. Barnum thing. It wasn't about any of that. It was about actually getting arrests and convictions in the murder. And we went and we had a meeting with an assistant, uh, or a. Uh, we went and we had a meeting with an assistant district attorney and we presented the book that we had written and he really wasn't feeling the case after reading the book. The book is, is kind of more like an encyclopedia and so it wasn't as concise uh, as he needed to see. So we redouble our efforts and we wrote 45 Tupac murder facts. You can see them on the American News website. Those are posted there. And we actually, with those 45 Tupac murder facts, got a little bit of traction in the case, had some interest. And now we had traction. The assistant district attorney said he's interested in the case. But what does he need to do to pursue uh, arrests and convictions? He needs a homicide investigator to start hauling in witnesses and to start interrogating them. And having struck out at LAPD and knowing that uh, the author of Murder Rap and what have you was wired in there and that that was really a whole cover up and a way to obfuscate the truth, we elected to go to the sheriffs. And I worked on uh, Jimmy McDonald's campaign wrote an article about him, interviewed him, and so I knew him. And uh, when I first met Russell, he and I had, you know, kind of reconnected Russell with Jimmy. 
and we were on several conference calls and we were also sending Jimmy McDonald uh, text messages on his cell phone. At a certain point, he quit responding to us. And so, you know, text messages to him went unanswered, messages left went unanswered. And so we pretty much got the cold shoulder from him. We should have taken that as a warning and we should have just left it alone. But we had an assistant district attorney who said he was interested in the case and that he wanted uh, to, uh, you know, work on it. And all he needed was a homicide investigator. And so I went to a meeting downtown. It was an alumni only meeting of which I happened to be an alumni. And the keynote speaker was Jimmy McDonald. And so I showed up there and I cornered him. And I said, hey, we need a homicide investigator. I don't think he really appreciated being cornered at a public event, but he agreed that he was gonna get us a homicide investigator. Gave me a number, told me to call his uh, assistant the next day, which I did. And I arranged a meeting for Russell and I to both go down to the sheriff's. Well, uh, as the meeting came closer and, and closer, uh, and the meeting was scheduled about three weeks out, and it's curious that uh, that Greg Cading, right after Russell's death, had said that he knew about the meeting three weeks before it happened, and it was exactly three weeks uh, that the meeting was scheduled before it actually happened, which means that they have pretty good sources inside of both the sheriffs and the LAPD. And so as the meeting's drawing closer, we're continuing to cultivate information. And I had sent a letter with the Tupac murder facts and with the confession letter to Suge Knight's attorney, Tom Mesereau, somebody that I knew in Century City from having done the newspaper there for a number of years. And I get an email back from Suge Knight's other attorney, uh, Thaddeus and Thaddeus says hey re just read your uh, just read your letter to my client and we need to talk and so it was about 11 o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night and I called him and he said I just read this to Suge Knight in his cell and he confirmed that it's all true confirming that little half-dead was the shooter, confirming that the confession letter was in fact true, confirming that that's what happened in the Tupac murder. And I said, Thaddeus, um, can I have Russell Poole call you? I'm sure he would love to talk to you because, you know, part of what Russell and I have concluded from this is that Suge Knight may be guilty of a number of crimes, but he is not guilty of Tupac's murder. And Russell feels bad about this, and he'd like to apologize to your client. Thaddeus said, please have him call me. I immediately call Russell Poole. I tell him what happened, and I tell him to call Thaddeus and talk to him. And Thaddeus talks to him, and Russell documents that, puts it into an affidavit that he sends to me. And he was at, uh, he was at, uh, like an Office Depot, Office Max, one of those type of places when he did the affidavit and he did it on a computer and sent it to me. You know, no ability to actually sign the affidavit, but he did send it to me. And I have that in an email from him, which to me is just like having a signed affidavit. So now we're armed with more information. He obviously calls and talks to the assistant uh, district attorney and uh, conveys this information and you know that's great he knows he's got this meeting coming up and so this has really started to uh, become very heavy information weighty information in trying to get a conviction and a prosecution in the Tupac murder trial and so about three days before the meeting, 
uh, I'm having a conversation with an informant who tells me that it was an off-duty sheriff that let shooters into the club at the One Oak and dropped them off at the airport the next day. And Russell also talked to this informant. We would do that. When Russell talked to somebody, then I would talk to them. And we found out that there was sheriff corruption. And now, three days before the meeting, it changes the entire dynamics of the meeting. And the day before the meeting, now, mind you, I'm supposed to go with Russell to this meeting from three weeks before. I'm originally scheduled to be a part of the meeting. And the day before the meeting, Russell gets a phone call from the homicide investigator that he's supposed to meet with, that I'm supposed to meet with too. And he's told, hey, this is a cop thing. Let's keep this amongst us cops. Carlin does not need to be there. And so I'm basically pushed out of the meeting. And in that conversation, Russell then says, hey, I just want to know one thing. Uh, we, I'd heard that there was an off-duty sheriff that let the shooters into the club at One Oak and dropped them off at the airport the next day. And the homicide investigator says, how the hell did you hear that? And Russell said, well, look, I really can't disclose how I know. And he said, but so it's true. He says, yes, it's true. But how did you know that? And that was that then changed the dynamics of what this meeting was going to be about, because it became more about how the hell did Russell find out about this information? And it was less about the Tupac murder at that point, because the sheriff really thought, hey, something's really up here and we got to get to the source of this information. Well, Russell and I talked about it uh, that day and uh, you know, we both said, hey, maybe it's not a good idea for you to go. And he said, no, no, no. I don't want to disappoint Jimmy McDonald. He had worked with Jim McDonald uh, at LAPD and he knew him from LAPD. I had only reconnected him after a number of years. And so Russell was determined that he was going to go to this meeting. He was armed with the Tupac murder facts. He was armed with the letter that I had sent to Police Chief Charlie Beck. He was armed with the confession letter. He was also armed with the picture of Reggie Wright at the MGM that he had confirmed that that was indeed Reggie Wright Sr. And uh, he had also sent it out to some of his cop buddies that had confirmed it. And so off he was going to the meeting the next day. I talked to him at nine o'clock in the morning. He was in traffic. He says, yeah, I'm in Diamond Bar. He says, I'm kind of stuck in traffic. But he says, I got an hour and uh, I can be there by 10 o'clock. And so that was the that was the last time I spoke to Russell and he said hey the minute I get out of this meeting I'm gonna call you and I sat and I waited and I waited and I waited and I remember I was sitting at a Mexican restaurant just kind of waiting to find out what was gonna happen I you know there was a possibility of meeting up with Russell after he had uh, lunch scheduled with somebody that, uh, that you know, he knew from previously that he was really excited to go meet. And uh, that lunch actually never happened because Russell died in the meeting. Now, uh, I get, a, I get a, an instant message from Alex. And Alex tells me, Hey, is it true Russell died? I get on the internet. It's all over the internet. I find it. And I find Reggie Wright Jr.'s statement about Russell Poole. And I listen to it in horror. Because Reggie knows exactly what was talked about in the meeting. He's talking about salient details of the case that only somebody that was in the know would know. And Greg Kading is out actually 
talking about how he had known about this meeting for three weeks, which is highly suspect. That's, that just screams cover up, the two of them knowing every detail about this. And Reggie is gloating about this, and Reggie uh, makes a threat to somebody who's constantly been on his uh, bad side and, and, you know, exposing Reggie that this person is going to be next and his friend, which means, which I think he's referring to me. So it's a threat from Reggie. And so this, you, you time this back, this had to have, this interview had to have happened about two hours after Russell had died. And walk that back. Two hours after he died, it takes processing time. You gotta upload it. I mean, we've done this YouTube stuff. So that means that Reggie had to have known almost immediately upon Russell dying that Russell had died in the meeting. Now what's curious to me, uh, my friend who had introduced me to Jim McDonald uh, called Jim McDonald and he said to him, hey, you know, Mike's buddy dies and you don't even have the courtesy to call him. And so I get a call from Jim McDonald and from Rod Cush. And I ask them about the details of the meeting. I ask them who's in the meeting. I get stonewalled. I get told that I can't know who all was in the meeting. But what they do tell me is that uh, Rod Cush was in the meeting and Biddle was in the meeting, but that there were a total of six people plus Russell in that meeting. The other four people, I'm told, I cannot know who they are, that it's secret and that they will not tell me. So the sheriff stonewalled me from knowing this. And what I'm told is that at the conclusion of the meeting, that Russell Poole grabbed his chest and died before he hit the floor. That's what I was told about Russell's death. I find out later from the family what they were told. They were told that he died in a waiting room before he ever even got into the meeting. And clearly from Reggie Wright Jr.'s uh, you know, YouTube interview, which by the way, I sent a link of that to Jimmy McDonald so that he would know about it. Uh, but anyway, from uh, Reggie Wright Jr.'s YouTube interview, we know that that's not true. And so the sheriffs are telling me one thing, they're telling the family something else, something that's highly suspicious. And at the time, Russell had been hiking six miles a day. He had a new job that was about to start. He had a spring in his step. He was getting close to solving two of the biggest mysteries in music history, and he was also looking at this, vindicating him from all of you know what he had gone through, being pushed out of LAPD, uh, being blacklisted in Los Angeles from being hired. Uh, so, you know, Russell had gone through a lot of struggles in his life that all trace back to the fact that here's a good man. Here's a good cop that's being maligned and being oppressed by the department. And by the way, when you read the LAPD policies, you find out that none of what Russell went through is policy for the LAPD. And it's actually time for LAPD to come out and say, hey, we were wrong. We did something wrong. And to vindicate Russell on their own. So obviously I get the call. I talk to Alex, uh, you know, on uh, Facebook Messenger and he says, hey, you know, it's all over the internet. Russell died and I start making phone calls. I call Sergio Robledo, who I had met before, and I say, Sergio, I mean, clearly uh, this is highly suspect. What do I do? And Sergio says to me, Mike, you have to get everything that you put together out as public as you can and as quickly as you can. And so from the Mexican restaurant, I come back and I work through the night 
to basically do a quick edit on everything Russell and I had been compiling. And everything that we had been compiling up to that point was all footnoted as to where the details came from. And that gets released as Chaos Merchants. Uh, Russell and I had agreed on the title uh, just before he died. And we were talking about, you know, what to call this. And it seemed like so much of what these people had done was to create chaos. And it just seemed like they were merchants, that they were constantly selling and creating chaos. So Chaos Merchants seemed like the appropriate title for what we had been working on. And it's not complete. It was never completed. Uh, Russell and I worked on it, but it was released in its form then. And uh, since then, I had a chance to go through it one more time and just do another light polish on it. But that stands as a work uh, that Russell and I had done. And really, when we'd worked on this, we worked on this for an audience of one. The first pages of Chaos Merchants were exactly what Russell had taken to the meeting with the sheriffs. And you can, you can see that. It's, it's all documented as to what he took there. They wanted him to bring everything, all of his case files and everything on a disc. And uh, we decided that that was not a good idea, that that wasn't something that we wanted to do. And he only showed up with the first, uh, first number of pages of Chaos Merchants. That's what he brought with him to the meeting. And Chaos Merchants was released. Uh, I sent it out to about 3,000 uh, hip hop places. And Chaos Merchants uh, also went out via uh, a press release and a link to the press release so that anybody who wanted to could read the information and that was the determination that was made between Sergio Robledo and myself uh, about this that's why this was released and so uh, Chaos Merchants is Russell Poole's last words about the Tupac and Biggie murders and uh, I have a lot more to say about this, and I'm sure over the next couple of days this will come out. Russell Poole died trying to solve the Tupac and Biggie murders. He dedicated his life to it. He dedicated his life to the truth. It cost him everything at LAPD. It cost him his career, and in many ways it cost him his family. He wasn't able to provide for his family the way that a uh, senior detective is able to provide for their family. He wasn't able to, you know, do things that people that have money do, and it cost him everything. More later.